podcast Co Music. Hello, everybody. We are now in uh, this new season nine, episode one, and we will be speaking with Enrique Mendoza Mejia from Mexico, but uh, now living in Austria and uh, developing his work in different countries. Well, uh, hello. Uh, thanks, first of all, a lot for the invitation. It's really cool to be here. And uh, well, my name is Enrique Mendoza Mejia uh, from Mexico City. And uh, well, I am a composer. I'm a musician. I started studying classical composition in Mexico. Then I went to the Netherlands to make a, a master's in composition for film. Jos Svanenburg, that was kind of my tutor there in the conservatorium. And he was the first one to show me about electronic music and electroacoustic. I started doing electroacoustic composition, electroacoustic music, and then I never stop. I keep on doing mixed music, like live instruments with live electronics, mainly with Max, patches, and these kind of tools. But little by little in the last two, three years that I started my PhD here in Austria is when I, I start writing a little bit less, less and less scores and just doing pure electronics, pure acousmatic music. Very briefly, well, what I am doing now is working a lot, uh, composing and performing uh, electroacoustic acousmatic in, the, in that sense of, the, of that style and dealing with multi-channel systems and with 3D audio or spatial audio. There are several ways of naming it. And, well, thinking about the composition, the electroacoustic composition through for these systems and also through these systems, no? what are the possibilities that they bring? And, of course, it's been already for a while here in Europe, mainly, uh, already more than 50 years. But, well, there is still kind of a lot of space and a lot of uh, ground to be discovered, I think. Well, for me, I mean, uh, Austria has been always kind of a little magnet in my life. When I was thinking about making a PhD, I always kind of back down because a lot of the, the PhDs were academic research. And I am not very much into, into that. I don't consider my, myself like a, a, an academic or, or very hardcore academic or anything like that, but more a composer, a musician. And I wanted to do a PhD. I wanted to do research, but the artistic part or the creation, uh, uh, the creative part should be the most important thing because what I don't want to do is to stop making music. So here in Austria, eh, I was doing a residency in, in Krems an der Donau, a, a city here in Austria, and then I I met uh, Folk Marklin, who is my first assessor now in the PhD, and he is teaching in the Anton Bruckner University, where they have this new PhD based on artistic research, practice-based and practice-led. It's from within your creation that you bring new knowledge to life not by analyzing your own work or by analyzing the work of others or researching about characteristics of the works of others, or not even you, it's about the creation. So I got accepted to the university and then, yeah, well, I moved here to, to Austria. Also, since I went to live to the Netherlands, for example, I took a decision about trying to do everything in English because I am living here in this side of the world. Everybody in the music circle I work speak English. If they do electronic music, I'm pretty sure they speak English and stuff. So I just wanted to keep it like, let's say, the more international, easy. Uh, even my scores, I took that decision, no? like as I was saying, like all the indications, all the writing is going to be in English. Lately, like a lot of uh, technologies in my life, let's say, came together and also, especially here in Austria, when I started my research here, it's also about the development or the design of a system that I did called the Hybrid Audio Diffusion System, as you were saying, the HATS, I call it. There are so many tools now also to make electronic. It's easy to get lost. And at the end, I kind of end up using the tools that I could go deeper with them. I could find a more organic interface for performing, for a recording for making the sound design of, of what I imagined for the pieces. For the live electronics, normally I was using a lot max to process the sound live and also for the performer to make it easy for them to perform with the electronics. But then in an easy setup, for example, with a MIDI pedal, just putting the patch in the next stage. I was working a, a lot with that, but uh, as I doing more and more uh, pure electronics without acoustic instruments, let's say, but also live. 
So that was like an, another stage that how I can perform uh, live electronics, that everything is being born already from the computer. But so I've been trying kind of developing, let's say, my own setup that is very personal, which controllers in this case is not very advanced in any sense, just also still using a DAW that could be Logic, could be Ableton Live now, that is very, very cool for, for live performance. Combining it, so these digital tools, but also with the analog world. So I use analog synthesizers. I also build my own little oscillators, uh, kind of lo-fi uh, mini scenes, but also with tiny uh, commercial scenes. But at the end, putting it everything on the computer and processing it live, mainly with spectral tools, tools that analyze the input, whatever I am doing from the analog scenes or like from live sources or from samples that are already recorded. Well, so this is a little bit a uh, kind of, let's say some of the tools for, for performing, also for uh, composing. When I am composing, one of the things that uh, for me is the main difference, for example, between writing scores and doing electronic music is that when I'm writing scores, normally it will become to life way later in the process, no? when you are maybe in the first rehearsals with the ensemble or with the performers. But then all that time, you were not working with the sound. You were working with paper, let's say, and your imagination. That that's It's not a complaint. It's just a description, let's say. But when I also compose electronic music, I am working and dealing with the sound right away. It's manipulating the sound, creating it with the synthesizer or with samples. I don't even have to write a score for those pieces. They don't need it. There is no useful, I mean, unless somebody wants to analyze them, right? Or something like that. But uh, trying to use a lot of types of different things and sensors and this and that and that. But well, also finding myself. In that aspect, sometimes I also combine a, a visuals, video, no? but well, we could talk about that later. Once I was doing in Mexico, uh, actually a couple of experiences that I have that will let me or allow me to explain also this idea of the multi-channel or how I, I arrived to these other technologies about spatial audio or immersive audio and spatial music 3D. And I was starting to build my own kind of things. Then I was doing actually a master uh, of, of a piece of mine. I was comparing how it was my stereo field with my speakers, with my headphones. And then in a moment, I kind of did a mistake. I put the headphones and I was listening in both systems. Okay, actually it was sounding cool, you know, and then I turn on again the speakers and turn off the headphones and okay, like something is happening. No, I am receiving different sources of the same sounds, but in different uh, uh, distances. And also I was closing my eyes and I was starting to hear some sounds in the back of my head. And the second one, we were checking the homework of a student about film. So they, he was showing me the sound design of a movie. When the movie was over, I started to, to, to give my feedback to the student. And then I said, and especially those sounds of a metal shop were amazing. And then we come back and there was nothing. And the sounds, they were from the environment of my street. In the corner, there is a metal shop. Due to the context I was listening, this idea of the open headphones, how another source can get in this sound stream at the same time that I am watching a movie. And because of the context, they did some kind of coherent sound thing, no? And I was listening it even in my left side. So I said that was kind of my second experience. I imagine like a lot in science and in art happens yeah, from a personal experience, and maybe I can I can research a little bit about that. Also, because of film, there is a lot of advancement in surround sound. Actually, in a lot of times, a lot of decades uh, since it started, uh, a lot of the development has been done in that field. Actually, not that much in the experimental music or in the electronic music. And now they are kind of together because now I you need to think about the space is another parameter. Well, even in stereo, we need to think about space because there is already a field. I started to really research and go in deep, not only in electronic music, like in composition, but in spatial music. And of course, well, you start to hear about, of course, Schaeffer and Stockhausen, no? like the French, the like Musique Concrete, and then the, the electronic music in Germany. They are the ones that start to also doing quadraphonics at the beginning, this and that, even though, as we were saying, Walt Disney already presented, I don't know what, in the 30s with speaker arrays and microphone arrays and these kind of things. And the binaural technology that you mentioned that I am uh, using it uh, now for my creation, 
It was invented in the 30s by Alan Bloomline, but it was not very used no, by the consumers until now. There is kind of this hype about spatial audio, immersive audio, but also a lot of people is listening now in headphones, way more than speakers than in the previous years. So it's kind of a perfect time to start doing things with binaural audio because people already has been listening in headphones, that that's what you need, no? That's the monitoring system for binaural productions. Anyone with a proper set of headphones will be able to listen a 3D uh, impression of the piece. So that's for sure. Everybody I recommend that get their best headphones they can. They don't matter if they are open or close or outside the head or the earbuds, no? Like if you concentrate and then you close your eyes and then you will be able to hear this sphere of sound around you and all the sounds moving. Of course, I prepare these versions for the radio, the radio edit, because then, of course, there is no hybrid diffusion system, right? It's going to be only headphones. So, yeah, we are missing a lot of the experience, but it's also a great experience to listen just binaural. And the thing I did in this case is to put what it was sounding on the speakers together with what was sounding on the headphones and created everything towards the headphones. You were speaking a lot about your hybrid audio diffusion system or HADS. So what I want to know, if it's like a setup uh, system or you is uh, movable, you change it uh, every time you, you make a new piece or you work with it. Going to the hybrid audio diffusion system, the, uh, everything was converging into that moment, right? That uh, it occurred to me this idea of, of develop and design the hybrid audio diffusion system. The main core is the idea is a hybrid diffusion system because I am using two monitoring systems at the same time. So I am using this idea of the open headphones to allow sounds from sources outside to come inside in the, in the audio stream and to use multi-channel speaker setups. But also, this idea can have multiple uh, ways of performing with it, and also I can put it in a, a lot of places. So it's kind of very modular in a way, but the idea is to have these two monitoring systems working at the same time. So for example, I don't know, in the university where I am working, uh, we have a speaker dome made of 20 speakers and four subwoofers. So I work that a lot. I have the headphones, Actually, also thanks to another research project with uh, Thomas Gorbach from the Vienna Kusmonium, we get some funding and then we bought a lot of headphones, for example. So we have now a little system for uh, 14 headphones for uh, uh, an audience of 14 people, for example. But well, for the composition, I just need one, right? But so this idea of the hybrid uh, diffusion system is to create a 3D sphere of sound with the headphones, with the binaural technology. So there is one field already, a 3D uh, sound field with the headphones around your head. And then with the technology of Ambisonics, I create another layer of uh, 3D audio with the speakers. And it can be expanded. It can be different types of uh, uh, speaker setups, but also so when I'm combining it with the headphones, the idea is to create an augmented 3D sound field. Normally, we only use speakers or normally we only use the headphones. And for me, the idea, I didn't invent the headphones or the speakers, just the idea of combining it and exploring it in a lot of perspectives, how this could work. And it, in reality, creates this augmented uh, 3D sound field. The idea is that I can put sounds inside your mind or inside your head, like with the with the binaural uh, render, that that's what happens when we listen to headphones, everything is here and even inside the head, right? It appears that the sound is coming from there and then take it super far to the speakers and even further with reverbs and this type of acoustic treatments that it can be uh, done. So the hybrid audio diffusion system at the end, it's consisting in the combination of open headphones and speaker arrays but yeah, like if I go to another place, another concert hall, and in that case, they have 36 speakers. So I take my headphones for the performance, for example, and then with Ambisonics, it's easy to what I already create as a sphere of sound with Ambisonics. I just decode it 
for the new uh, multi-channel uh, speaker array. That's one of the advantages of Ambisonics of this technology that is independent of the monitoring system. We started to use it now because just in the recent years, in the late maybe four or five years, now there are even free uh, digital tools to use it. Before that, it was invented in the 70s, for example, but we couldn't use it too much, this idea of Ambisonics, because there was not too much technology developed and it was not on the reach of everybody. Now, anyone with a DAW, you can have these plugins for free. And then, of course, the idea, like everything, is how you create with it and, and all, all that part. Also, the hybrid audio diffusion system allows, for example, one of the pieces that we will listen to put also live sources. So for example, in that piece and for that performance, we have a multi-channel speaker system in the Musikverein here in Vienna. I had to put 100 headphones for all the people and there was an ensemble. It was a string quartet, a piano, percussion, and also a video. So people was listening things in the binaural field with the headphones, sound coming from the speakers and also from an ensemble that it was in front of them. So the, at the end, I think the, the hats allows a lot of possible setups. For example, some things that I haven't done, but it's still in the plan of uh, pieces in the next uh, year, for example, is to do things in the nature. There is a way to take small, light, multi-channel systems. For example, the Autosonics, it's a do-it-yourself, amazing multi-channel system of that you can uh, create 24 uh, channels, 24 speakers, and then take them and it's very easy to set up and stuff. But so, for example, imagine in the nature, I can put speakers everywhere in the woods and then people also walking around the woods, listening the environment. Then I can also bring the environment to the piece and to the composition, right? Or if we are close to a river, so the sound of the river, what I will put in the headphones, what can be also sounding in the speakers and people can move. Um, that would be, for example, one of the uh, uh, of the pieces I want to I wanna do later. Another thing, it would be head tracking, no? Because for the binaural, for example, in, in, in video gaming, they use a lot, and also now in art, in a lot of multimedia art, the idea of head tracking. So if you have headphones that have a head tracker, you can also allow people to move on the space and do something with that movement, right? Because you are tracking it so that can, if I get closer to the speaker, something starts sounding, uh, sounding stronger or brighter or a lot of things can happen, no? A lot of possibilities open again. That's why I'm being very cautious to just focus, open little by little the doors because then uh, also for my research could be just too much, but I think, yeah, the system allows to, to really a lot of a lot of possibilities. And in the performance I've been doing with this presenting, it's been from small studios with 16 speakers for 10 people, for like the one I said, for 100 people. In, I don't know, in Berno, we presented with the Acusmonium, so like the, the Vienna Acusmonium that we are working in this development of the virtual Vienna Acusmonium, that it's my system, the hats, but also together with all the concept of an acosmonium, not just a speaker dome, but the idea also to perform it live. So you have speakers all in the space, also working with the space, but then a little dome of ambisonics plus headphones. So it's just a lot. And then that goes also to the performance side that we can speak in, a, in another moment. It's perfect where you finish because mm -hmm. now we can go more deep in the sources of your creative process. You already told us a little bit about the sampling or the field recordings that you use, mm -hmm. but if you can give us that you talk about your sources as a creative process, you already explained the- The, the technical part. The, yeah, yeah, up and down inside your mind and the feeling of the time. I also want to know if you work somehow with AI or some sources or if the material decide your timing or you have already a structure? I think in this case, for example, it would be the best to speak about around a specific piece, no? So I keep it like, let's say, limited and framed to, to that piece. And then maybe I can go fast through the pieces because they have normally very different uh, yeah, approaches. sources or, mm. or in, in a way it's... I end up doing similar things, but of course with, with different ideas. The first work that uh, I would like to present is this uh, piece called 
inner outer self variants and my deranged disembodied voices. I know it's a very peculiar uh, title that I thought it as a joke and everybody thinks that it's just too serious and it was like, dude, it's a joke, but well, maybe I should change it. But the idea is how this piece was born. So this was a commission from the Black Page Orchestra to be performed in one of their concert series called Paranoia. So sometimes I'm a little bit autistic, so they tell me, okay, this is paranoia and stuff. And I said, okay, that, that's going to be the idea. I want to now how I could create a piece that, of course, in an artistic way, in an imaginary way, not, I don't want to make it totally realistic, of course. How could I create paranoia in the audience? Or at, little, at least discomfort, like something really weird is happening during the performance. So that was kind of the framework for me to create this thing. How can I create the sensation of paranoia in the audience? Then I started to read and to investigate, for example, and I came with the concept of the auditory hallucinations that I think is really, really peculiar, weird and crazy in a sense. How can we listen a lot of sounds of, of people that has auditory hallucinations can really believe all these things that are happening outside their minds. No, well, it's in their minds, but they think it's outside. There are very different types of auditory hallucinations. There are verbal hallucinations. So like you can hear yourself with a delay or yourself giving you orders or another person. Of course, you can hear verbal things. You can have non-verbal hallucinations and that could be noises, machine noises, animals, even the tinnitus, some kinds of tinnitus could be considered an auditory hallucination in certain patients, no? There are even musical hallucinations. There is people that hallucinate that there are really somebody's playing classical music or whatever type of music, and they this confusion that they really think it's from a real source in life, right? That's kind of the auditory hallucination. So, okay, this idea is said, okay, I will try to create a trip of a schizophrenic person and how it would be to be in their mind for 14 minutes, for example, or whatever the piece works. So, and then in this case, everything is an hallucination or is working towards an hallucination. So the ensemble that is playing, the Black Bash Orchestra, was a musical hallucination happening at the same time. It's the first time I use text, for example. I have used text in a lot of other pieces, but just to take out the rhythm, to take out some kind of things, but I was not saying words. In this case, I made some dialogues and I really wanted to use voice because then I think it would be more closer for me, it was a tool to try to create this paranoia because with voices, we can get a little bit more creepy emotions. Sometimes, for example, I recorded and then also coming to the recordings, I did very different types of recording. And the one you mentioned, I think you hear some flutes and percussion like from Mexican Aztecs, no? Because then for all these weird hallucinations, I recorded with binaural mics so I can put a couple of microphones in my ears and with a little recorder, I can record binaural walks or my movements. So I went to Chapultepec, a very beautiful park in Mexico City, where there are like these dancers that they get into a pole, these indigenous dancers, and they are playing a little a, a pre-Hispanic flute. And there are also these guys dance with the wewetl, with the drums, with the Aztec drums. And what I did is I walk all around this park, recording all these old people is selling things so you can hear these voices and in some moments disappear in the piece. I also, for example, record my niece with the binaural microphones talking to me just here in the back of my head saying, oh, I know you killed her. Or also just like doing, how do you say that in English? So just so, um, moaning, kind of moaning. So. I already knew that for the binaural render, I want things that cripple you down, you know, like that, oh, you feel like a little bit this kind of, because there are these voices, something that's peculiar from binaural, no? Like if everybody has heard, for example, the barbershop video in YouTube, 
I recommend you. That's an amazing binaural experience. You hear and it appears that they are cutting the hair to you because of this binaural thing, no? But so, and then I also did some other type of ambisonics recordings for the speakers and a lot of synthesizers in this case. But the voices are processed to create all these textures that come and go. And of course, you will hear at the end of the piece how I could manipulate one of the voices to create a kind of a robot-like I understand but I don't understand everything for the paranoia, no? And speaking a little bit about the artificial intelligence, in this case, no, I don't work that much with artificial intelligence. It was the first time in this piece this year that I did it and it was in the way of creating, I was creating the text and the dialogues a little bit based in the science fiction movies I like, in the very dark, very, very creepy, dark kind of uh, movies sometimes that I like. I was basing these dialogues, but I use the artificial intelligence into use the software that you feed text and then gave you they give you a, a narration. So with, through artificial intelligence, you can put voices to this text. You can even say, for example, the speed of the voice, certain inflections, uh, you are sad, you are happy, emotions. There are this type of software. So that's how I use it, artificial intelligence in this work. And not it was too much involved in the creative process or anything. I use it as a tool to be able to bring all this text and all these ideas that I needed to life. For example, why? Because also I could have record narrators, right? That would be one, one way. But in this case, I said, okay, I want to try it. They sound really cool. And also in the sense, artistically, because these voices are going to become generic. You know, everybody's going to start listening this timber of voices of this AI in a lot of things in YouTube, in commercials, they are already using this to narrate things. So I wanted to, to have like this kind of common voice in the recordings in the of, of the piece, you know, that maybe in a couple of years, people will say, ah, okay, this is the voice of here. So I didn't want to hide it, that it was a artificial intelligence, but at the same time, they are very realistic. So you can even forget that it's artificial intelligence and just listen what they are saying, no? For the confusion, there are, in parts, you can really hear it, in another parts you cannot, but that's the point. All the time in the speakers, there are voices of different kids, women and guys, are reading some text in very different languages, like in 10 languages or something like that. So with this, I could, with the artificial intelligence, I could just translate the same text to all these languages and make all these kind of uh, virtual actors to read this text. And then I was getting this as a sound file. I was bringing it to the DAW, composing my dialogues, processing them as always I do to create the other parts of the piece or the rest, the sounds that goes with these voices, for example. And then, of course, always thinking about the space and how can I create with this spatial idea of the hybrid audio diffusion system with the ensemble there, with a video, to create this paranoical or a little bit super stressy, schizophrenic experience in this piece. In this case, the only thing that comes with microphones are these binaural recordings and one ambisonics recordings. I have to say that every time I presented, at least two, three people told me like, dude, that was just crazy and it was really a, a paranoid a, a moment or this is just sick. I want it to be over or these kind of things. But yeah, it's a little bit massive and intense. Of course, it's an intense experience in this first piece. Okay, let's start. Rule number one, no whining.
Hello. 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 What's wrong with those people? I can't do it. You have no choice. Have to hold it together. Who's that? Who's who? That picture. My daughter. The dead one. What? You killed her, remember? What about you? What about me or you? It's the same thing. Any mental illness. Any weakness. You must put this on. And that is a shotgun. Come on, come on. Put your arms here. Drill sounds. Oh my. Lie down from the dollar. Screams. Screams. It's time to tell you who you are. You recognize me. Radio transmission voice. They discovered the teddy bear. The white teddy bear became a symbol of the hunt. You were a spectator in honor as suffering. You were there and just watch. watch. Rule number three. Do not flirt with the violin player. All the talking and talking never fucking stops. I can't think through all the noise. Made it last year because I was on drugs. It's the fear of the shock. Why? What? I mean, I don't feel comfortable doing this. What? I can't do it. Why? First time moves. It's too fast. Roll with it. I don't want you to see. Oh no, Mr. Fucking Ethics. She is real. This is too real. Coughing. What is this? Not a big shot of fuck all. Fuck all. Everybody giving orders. Everybody saying what to do. Everybody expecting something. To talk. Never to talk. This is a good. I stopped the eyes and they muffled the sound. And they still speak to me. Always there. Okay, we need to get out of there. They are watching us all night. Your turn. No. Remember, it is just a transition. Soon, freedom. No more voices. No more memories. Please. You cannot die Please. without a pre-purchased burial plot. I don't want it. Destroy everything now. How long this is going to take? It's okay. I can hear you do this. Hello. I am here to explain what happened. I am dead. No, no. Nobody is dead. We don't die anymore. Remember? Dad, you are a copy. Copy of what? A copy of you. But I am me now. Now? That's what you see. Come and stop screaming. No? Okay. I had to meet you. I don't hear you now. Well, of course. I'm sorry. It is so making you cry. It's slavery. Do you know who the is slavery? I'm a man. That happens. She's dead. There is no one to I didn't say anything. So it was not me. What about that? What girl? We will go forward and join yourself. Can we talk? I get nervous with tests. I don't know. Sorry, I did tests as a kid, but I'm silent. Answer the first thing that comes to mind. Okay, sure. Clogging boat. The city. What? I was born there. You like it? Yeah, sure. Did we start the test? Are you comfortable? Um, not really. What? Why what? Why are you are not comfortable? Too many people. And? Coughing. Don't want to get sick. Have you been sick? Don't you remember? Is this the test? Yes. You walk and enter the ocean. Never been in the ocean. Doesn't matter. You walk and enter the ocean and you feel which one? Which what? Which ocean? Doesn't matter. Okay. In the ocean you feel the hand holding your hand. Is the hand of the kid? A kid? Yes. A young boy. You know what is a kid. Sure. Never seen one. Doesn't matter. What do you mean? Can be any kid. You lose him in the ocean and he drowns. You don't do anything to help him. Why? Why would I? Is a kid. Never seen one. And still, you would let him die. What? 
This are just questions. Let's continue. You are in a helicopter that is on fire. Will you push your mother to save yourself? Mm. Okay, nice to joke. joke. Or fiction. Go on. Beat it. a fake moustache that causes laughter in church. Of course, I am happy.
timing that has to deal with so many things because of course in the bag of time we can even talk about metrics and rhythmic and but i imagine that you also mean a little bit more like the macro structure and how i deal with time in that a little bit more in the general part not like what is happening exactly in the moment right because that also is part of the time process depending on the piece for example in this piece I just described, I will try to use the same one so everybody knows what I am talking a little bit about. For example, the time has to do a lot with the dialogues in this case. I think when you are using lyrics and when you are using text, of course, that will give you a lot of the timing. Well, at least if, if I want to hear all the ideas, I need a time for somebody to speak to them, well, or sing them or whatever. And I need that time to listen to them, right? So depending on the material we are using, I think the time changes a lot. In this case, I did like an introduction. Then I started to put some scenes. I structured it like different types of scenes. So there are seven scenes. I wanted to do like a finishing part, like a cadenza, let's say, but a very long one. So it's like three minutes, no? So it's kind of a, a part by itself. And then, for example, this idea of a structure kind of in a timeline, what should happen and what are the relations of the material between each other during the time. So everything has a consequence, everything or is coming from some, but something there are not kind of an anomalies within some rules that I build for myself that I am also willing to break, of course, no, in a sense. But something free, for example, is even though I have maybe this structure, but for example, I don't have the duration of every section. And then the duration is going to be done more like what is the, in this case, the voices are, I am using, how long I need for the dialogue, the space of the dialogue, you know, like uh, in between, I want to make like little dramatic pauses, let's say, and also with the combination with the other sounds and the processes of the same voices, what I am constructing, then it becomes organic, no? How long I leave a sound, how short I do it and stuff. That has to do with by listening and composing the sounds, putting the sounds little by little, but I let it flow. And if that part, it end up being one minute or three minutes, then I don't care, no? It's because the 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 sound gave me, let's say, what I could take from it. But that would be in, in this piece because of the dialogues. For example, in the second piece that uh, uh, you will hear this piece based on poems, it was more based on the recordings of the poet reading its own poetry. No. No? With this Ernesto Cardenal, the poet of the, of the revolution then in South America, is not the politics talk, it's about the poetics, no? But for example, I, here I was manipulating the voices. You will not recognize that they are voices. You can recognize that they are voices, of course, but it's not the point. So in this case, I didn't, there is no meaning in the voice, right? I will not listen the text. I will not listen the words. So in this case, the timing 
Uh, I like to create the idea of the spatial concept, what is going to happen inside, outside. I'm going to do songs. I'm going to do certain movements with certain meanings, for example. And then the timing of those has to do a lot by listening. So, for example, I am making a movement, let's say, from front to back in the left and right. So, okay, I listen and I make it with the 3D panel, no? And then I hear it again with my eyes closed and, oh, that was a little bit fast. I felt it a little bit fast, so I do it again, but more slower. And then, yeah, the sound ends up longer or shorter, depending on this kind of how much the material give me to be able to compose with it, to specialize it. And because you are also in a different emotional state, and, and I think that changes always the perception of time. No? Perception of time is very relative. No? Depends. One hour can be very short or can be very long, depending on the context, right? But so, yeah, I definitely do plan my form. I definitely do plan the structure because then I only need to put the content, right? It's a little bit like this. Uh, Brian Fernie, how it was once explaining this very cool idea of, uh, I don't know if you have a... For example, I have this little glass. This is the form. This is the shape, right? And then the experience I will have if I put a little bit of water and I drink water, well, the water took this shape, right? But then I can put coffee mm, and I drink it. So it came in the same shape, but the content was different and my experience was different. Then I can put some peanuts, no? And then ah, I can eat them from here. Another experience. I can put tequila and whoop, it's going to be another experience. Or I can do crazy things like put nails and then I swallow nails. Well, that was a terrible experience and everything came in the same shape. A lot of people think that it's creating new structures and it ends up being a rondo, right? You know, like, or how, how we think this? For me, it's a matter of having a framework, how are going to be the relations of the material in time. And then I also think a lot structure and form about parameter changes. Normally, how do we feel that we are in a new section in a piece? It's because a lot of the parameters change, right? I mean, the pitch or the, or the frequency, the timber, rhythm, the space, for example, or the dynamics. So in a moment, if I change these five parameters at the same time, immediately I will feel that I am in a new section because it's totally contrasting with the previous one. If I come with these five parameters and I just change a little bit the timber, everything stays the same, but instead of staccatos, everything is legato, I feel that I am in the same section, right? It just, something is developing and to try to make it interesting all the time, right? I've been doing the same dynamics almost all the time. That happens a lot because I like loud music, but sometimes it's, a little bit, it's, a, it's loud. <laughs> but for example, I... I am all the time checking this idea of these five parameters that I can repeat, repeat them is everything that has to do with frequency, everything that has to do with time. They are big sacks, of course, no? A lot of things fall in this. Everything that dynamics, timber, and space. There are the five parameters. And it depends. When I also was doing a lot of writing music, I was planning it a little bit even more the, 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 the forms to, to, for the score and also the ideas with the instrument. To, but a little bit also the same, no? like a, how can I give very interesting timbrical changes, very interesting dynamic changes, tempo changes, space changes, and I, what I was missing, timbrical, no? or pitch changes. I wanted to ask you in these parameters that you were talking, where do you put silence? Because silence was very risky in a way that I heard the first time. Yeah. Uh, and I'm asking... Right now that you are explaining this last part about the parameters, that uh, are you using silence as a, a structure, as a yeah, change of feeling in time? Or what was the silence in this, exactly this piece? Because it was yes. very, very surprising. Exactly. Actually, I, I, I wanted to only use it as a surprise and as a dramatic effect. So because almost... Actually, yeah, I don't use too much silence, especially in, in, in electro electronic music. It's all these kind of textures evolving and things come and go, but there are very, very few places of silence. And in this piece, yeah, I wanted to, I was coming from a certain texture and I wanted to give a very drastic impression when this brrr, kind of a very low and high electricity sound starts to, to, to sound. But I wanted to kind of clean for a little bit of a moment um, 
the, the sound, the texture to arrive to that. So we are having uh, a lot of sound, a little bit of noise, one second of silence, and then so this kind of come. It's just like that little tiny moment uh, before the storm, you know, or like a, like where you are going to have an accident in the motorcycle. I don't know if you ever have that, but you, you know, like, okay, you have one second, you know that you are going to fall <laughs> and then you fall, right? But kind of that little moment just to bring everything to back and then come back again. But so in this piece, I use the silence just to give that dramatic effect, let's say. It's even used in movies, you know, uh, the, this idea of this second of silence and then the bomb explodes or something happens. Almost, I think, in all these pieces that I am presenting, there is no silence. They start with sound and they go almost to, till the end with sound. Maybe because of that, when I hear it, I was surprised for the other four pieces also. Like uh, oh. Yeah, and in this case, it's the only moment. So that's why also it makes sense, you know, because also the joke, you can just tell it so many times, no? You can do it once because if not, you already know what is going to happen, right? Like these kind of surprises. If I am doing something for solo flute and electronics, well, of course, I need to think a lot. They need to breathe. And then I can, I can go like to the electronics then leave a little bit the flute, make more silences and stuff. But yeah, I have to say that, yeah, I like this kind of more continuous music a lot, inspired maybe by, I don't know if you know, Phil Niblock, kind of one of the really cool guys about drone music, no? Uh, he's kind of the father of drone music. And this, I was in a concert of him, like this 45 minutes of just changing very, very few, this mass of sound, super loud. No, there is no millisecond of silence. Also, I like it, no? Maybe, yeah, I should do more silence, definitely. You did a study also in Amsterdam, Carnatic music, and you come yes. from the rock, from yes. the, yeah. So it is like logical that you come with this no silence, no stop somehow. Of course, when I was a kid, I started with rock and roll. I started playing the electric guitar. I have a metal band, like a power metal band for, for several years. And then I started to study classical composition for seven years. Took me to, to make my full bachelor degree was a lot. And then little by little, I, I just realized that every time I thought, okay, I knew this, I knew that something was coming in my life to show me how few I knew about music, you know? And there is so much to learn about music. And then instead of being close, I, I started to get very interested in, in the music of all the world, let's say. So to, for example, listen a lot of more Latin music, dance Latin music, because I also wanted to dance, right? I, I, I wanted to learn how to dance cumbias and salsas and this type of tropical music. And then also finding amazing musicians in that styles, amazing percussion players. And then also because of my friends, I started to to deal with Arab drums and Middle Eastern uh, percussion drums, for example. And I went also like three, four years to just play Arab drums. I bought a couple of Arab drums. I still have them and I play them very often. When I was in Amsterdam, for example, I have an Iraqi professor that was living there. So he could uh, show me Darbuka. He was my teacher for a year of Darbuka. And then it's also when I learned about electronic music. Unfortunately, now they are closed. So another time that also, again, my mind opened, this same guy showed me Carnatic music. So I was by myself trying to explain Explore the music from all the world, but different figures in my life. Okay, I found an amazing composer called Andy Scordis, for example, that he's been living in Amsterdam. We met there, so we knew both about Carnatic music, and then we were practicing, and he was uh, teaching me a lot and, and helping me to, to be able to sing that kind of things, uh, these compli complex rhythms that I also use for composition when I write a lot of the of the music. But he was showing me about gamelan music, for example. He was living in Indonesia. So he was bringing all this knowledge and showing it to me. And then from Japan, from Africa, also little by little myself, reading in books, getting drums, getting instruments, and try to, to go all around the place. I bought a didgeridoo when I was playing didgeridoo, like also for two years. And for example, that I really like how to make this meditative music that, okay, let's play one hour the didgeridoos and nobody stops, no? And brrr, it's a very different uh, um, spiritual kind of idea also with the Carnatic music, no? About these very long improvisations of 45 minutes. Of course, they have silence, but it's just like a continuous dialogue of 40 minutes. So, yeah, I think all these influences with the technology, with the composition I study from, of course, Europe, I have to accept it and I like it. And I don't renegate at all by that. That's why actually I live here, because I can do my stuff. 
A lot that you need to start dealing is the, the the semiotics. What is the meaning of the space? What is the meaning of the movements that we do? And of course, for me, space is one of the main parameters of composition. It's a compositional parameter as time, as a frequency or pitch, whatever you want to call it. Uh, they are different, but the spatial aspect of the piece is already uh, leading sometimes a little bit the ideas of how I will compose. The hybrid audio diffusion system is really giving me a new new ways. Now, when I am creating with the speakers and the headphones, it has already triggered new, new ideas, at least. New imaginations, new imaginary worlds that I would like to explore. What if I do this while in the headphones is sounding this, in the speakers is sounding this other thing? What is the relation between one or the other? What if one is rotating to the right and the other is rotating to the left? And yeah, let's see where where it goes. No, it's kind of getting some 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 traction, let's say. And then 
especially also working with, with the Vienna Cosmonium from Thomas Gorbach. We are working together and doing the a lot of things with the Acusmonium and also start to integrate. And we already did a concert that it was the Acusmonium with a dome is within the Acusmonium with an ambisonic 3D sound field already. And then also plus the headphones no, in, in two different festivals. And it's been really, really cool to, to, to put together all these concepts. For example, in the performance with the hats, I can still control the volume of headphones towards the speaker arrays or different types of speakers and kind of do, as it was an acousmonium, the blending, the movement of sounds from the headphones to the speakers, these distance movements, still doing them with faders live. Sometimes oh, I already have also everything automated. So in sometimes I just put play and that goes like in sound installation, some other context. But if the context is appropriate, I am also, uh, this came as a result of the research and working with the Acusmonium that this live part of also uh, performing it, making a hybrid performance, it, it started not using ambisonics, live ambisonics, and moving the sound with, with ambisonics encoders, like the panners, the 3D panners, let's say, but also with the faders, and so combining different types of files at the same time, binaural, ambisonics, and discrete channel files for the speaker. So we are developing this hybrid performance side, no, also. When you are going to keep a version of what you were doing in live setup, do you reconstruct also the data from the space that you were working in this immersive and how you are doing that? You are going to share with us five audios in this podcast and yes. the radio program. Can you tell us if I have a normal headphones right now and they are not open but closed? Are we going to experience at least one part of what you were really experiencing in the live version? Yes. Well, uh, of course, uh, yeah, we, we will be missing the half, right? It would be to kind of show you a movie that it was in 3D, but now we will see, we will hear the 2D version. Everybody, I recommend that get their best headphones they can. They don't matter if they are open or close or outside the head or uh, the earbuds, no? Like just uh, the best that you have. And then you, if you concentrate and then you close your eyes and then you will be able to hear this sphere of sound around you and all the sounds moving. So, yeah, we are missing a lot of the experience, but actually I have to say that it's, it's also a great experience to listen just binaural. In this case, what I, I brought to you for the radio is five versions, binaural versions of the full piece, no? All the sounds that are outside or inside now they are in this new version for the binaural. When I am performing, that's why it's different. When I am performing with a hybrid audio diffusion system, then yeah, I need open headphones because there will be the speakers. And then I need people to, the audience, to listen what is on outside and what is inside. But in this case, if you are just listening the full binaural version, any headphones, they will work, no? And of course, like any other thing, even Michael Jackson sounds better if you have better headphones, right? For my compositions, all the ideas of the acoustics and the spaces and the rooms I am creating is just a production of fiction and of my imagination. And you will hear there are a lot of this kind of, I try to create certain imaginary spaces that I have a ball of energy in the center and there are winds, solar winds going around. What would that sound? Of course, it's my imagination and I try to achieve that both. Um, for example, if I compose in a studio, I don't try to reproduce the acoustics of that studio to bring it to another concert hall or another studio or wherever where I present the, the music because it's going to change, right? For example, these speaker domes in concert halls, uh, some are very dry, not too much acoustics, no? So be because it's really cool for electronic music. And but there are you sometimes go to places that it's super reverberant. So of course, this is always gonna happen even with acoustic music, you know, like a string quartet in in this concert hall and in that concert hall, because of the acoustics, it will sound a little bit different. But so in this case, well, no, I just move it, everything should happen more or less the same, but of course the space will take something into account. 
What I did for the for my PhD is that I need to do some listening tests to be to prove that my system or the hybrid audio diffusion system it's really bringing the impression that you are more immersed in sound. So with the hybrid audio diffusion system, I could prove that a lot of experienced assessors perceived more immersiveness. Also, this idea of sounds going inside to outside the head. And for that, you, I needed to compare a lot of different types of signals with the headphones, with open headphones, with that, that, that. And in that case, yeah, one of the, the requirements, it was to put the acoustics of the space in the binaural render. So I did it for the listening test. So I could, I learned how to, de- to do it. I started just reading manuals and things like that. I bought a microphone, a reference microphone, and I was able to do it. So to measure the frequency response of the headphones of every speaker of the room for my listening test, because it's as, as it's a laboratory experiment, everything should be there, all the information. And so, I don't know I, if I answered that part of the question, like that for my creation and my composition, I more try to create imaginary fictional worlds. And sometimes it's a normal river or a crazy river or try to play with what should be inside and outside the direct source outside and the river closer. That's actually normally works the other way trying to go more to, for that, for example, because still when I change from place to place, acoustics are going to change. But there are very cool projects about what you are saying. The other thing is that for for doing that, what you need is to create an impulse response of the space. So, for example, there is also even free software. What you really need, the main thing is to have a reference microphone, a proper microphone that is calibrated to do these measurements. So what you do is that you put the microphone, let's say, where is the sweet spot where the people is listening? If we are just in a stereo sound, so you just put it where the head of the engineer it is, for example. And then with this software, you will create, you can create with white noise, or there can also like a sine wave sweeps, you know, that go from 20 hertz to until 20,000 hertz. And all that is, of course, going through the speakers. And the microphone is getting all that sound but already with the information of the space because it's getting the reflections of the space. So with that software, you can be, you can see and you can measure and and see the free, uh, the the amplitude because of each frequency, how is there, how many seconds of reverb it's in every frequency and with which volume, volume, that's a better explanation, right? So you can see the spectrogram of the space and stuff. And, that impulse response that you created through these uh, tools, no, like in the old, very old days, it was like, I think a little gun with, bah, you can blow a balloon, you can clap, you just also need pam. This impulse response, uh, impulse that gives you the resonance of the space. And you can measure this resonance, the reverb of the space, the reverberations, the early reflections and the river of the space. And also, you remember that actually there is something called the convolution reverbs. Logic has one. Remember, the the space designer is a convolution reverb. These technologies that you can, this impulse response, this little audio file with the information of the space, you can import it in one of these reverbs in a convolution, convolution reverb, and the plugin digitally will take this information, analyze it, and make it the space for you, and then you control it as any other river. That's a little bit the tools. You just need this free software. It's called Room EQ Wizard, R-E-W. You can download it. It's for free, and then you only need to buy a proper microphone. There are very cheap ones, and there are, of course, very expensive ones. With $100, you can get a mid-range, but it's you can already do these kind of things measuring the acoustics of the place and bringing them to the digital world and then being able to reproduce them. That's why uh, actually the first ones were some Dutch from the Netherlands, a company called Altiverb. They invented this Altiverb and it, I think it was the first convolution river that is still there. And it's amazing because, well, it's very expensive, like $800. But what they do is that they really go to all these amazing famous places. So the Carnegie Hall, the Walt Disney Center, the Berlin uh, Philharmonic uh, Concert Hall, they measure the space. They do all these input responses. And when you are digitally in your computer, you can choose 
from the reverbs in the presets, Carnegie Hall, Walt Disney Center, and then you can put your band or your music in those places. And it's hyper realistic in that case, for example. No, If I may add, that's also another part of the things that you can do with a hybrid audio diffusion system or in any case with any ambisonics system or any ambisonics piece is that the sound sources can be from a lot of different types. So I can use, of course, binaural recording because there are also binaural mics and then I can just put them already in the binaural render for the headphones combined with mono, stereo, other type of sources. In the speaker array, I can also use mono sources, move them as a dot in a sphere of sound, a theoretical sphere of sound around the, the person, a stereo, and move them left and right here, and then move them in this also sphere where is left and where is right. And there are also ambisonics microphones. So there are a, a different types of ambisonics mics that are already capturing this theoretical sphere of sound. The more order of ambisonics, there is something called the order, the, the first order, second order. So the higher order ambisonic mics, they capture more resolution. Let's say they have more megapixels, no? like in a camera, it's just an, an analogy. You have just more resolution. And then you can create in the, in, in the part where you are composing, making this, synthesizing this sphere of sound, you can combine all these different types of sources. So for example, if you went to uh, the nature and the woods and record with an ambisonics mic, how the wind was moving in the trees, you can put that and make it your environment in the speakers. And then um, a voice that was recorded in mono, you can move it through the space in trajectories around in circles and stuff. A stereo thing, you can just put it in front or make stereo windows, you know? So th there is also, all that is kind of technical in a sense because you need to know all these recording techniques, but is amazingly creative. And a lot of the art starts there. How do you get your sources? How do you record the things? Because then how you will synthesize this sphere of sound, composition, editing, kind of sound uh, engineering, and then how you will monitor the things you did.
my workflow to work in the hats. That's part of the research. Also, the signal workflow for the door. I can, I will, it, it's open for everybody so they can see how I deal with the headphones and the speakers. That will be part of the research. And also, well, try to share it, you know, as, as what you were saying with these people that they didn't want to share the secrets. Yeah, there is a lot of that. Uh, I definitely like to share it because everybody shares it with me. So let's share the knowledge. Let's spread the bread. Uh, but yeah, I think we should definitely share share all these ideas, especially because then the thing is to be able to be creative and to create things, no? It's not about to possess the tool or possess the knowledge. It's like uh, when maybe for, for two, three years, there were just like four guys with electric guitars and they were the only ones to, that possess that tool and can create these type of sounds. But now, for example, nobody cares that somebody has an electric guitar. Everybody can have an electric guitar, right? Now the point is how you play and how you compose for the electric guitar, not about owing the tool or knowing the tool. So it's not about that. I don't want to share that it's ambisonics or the 3D audio stuff. There is all, all everything is there. Now the thing is that... Uh, Let's create music, uh, 3D audio, 3D spatial music, whatever. And then we, I'm pretty sure there are going to be good pieces, mediocre pieces, bad pieces, and we all get a little bit, we need to learn, right? A little bit about the tools, but yeah, definitely share.
Just thank you for explaining us all these things. It's a lot, <laughs> but it was really interesting. Super, and this yeah, yeah, is yeah, recorded, glad. so we can hear it again. It was like a masterclass, uh, ah, thank you. which is great because uh, our podcast, uh, not only to know you, but to learn, I find that we can give it also this acknowledgement if the people have the patience to hear. Thank you again very much. I enjoy it a lot talking with you and that uh, you give me the opportunity of talking about my my process, my, my, my music, the tools, and just uh, that, remember that it's not about the tools, it's about the music at the end, always. But the, also the democracy of the tools, I find. Democratization of the tools, exactly, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. The democratization, because that's what's not happening for a long, long, long time, and now it's happening, and everything is possible now. Exactly, and that makes even more the point that we need to to learn to use these tools, to, to, to make it a skill, to make a craftsmanship of these tools, because, yeah, everybody has a laptop. Everybody can do a record in their room. But so it's not a ma more about the tool. We all, all have them. So now we need to do good music <laughs> with the tools. We have even the responsibility, no? Like as the tools are there, let's, let's use it nice and good. And, well, everybody should do whatever, no? Because also freedom is free, let's say. But we can, we can really use the tools, not because of the tool or because we possess the tool, but we can create with the tools.
reiteramos la invitación a todos ustedes para seguirnos en los diversos episodios de este podcast llamado Comusic, en el que estaremos presentando creaciones nuestras y de nuestros colegas. Si quieren conocer algo más de nuestro trabajo o recorrido, pueden acceder a la página web https comusicpro comusic con k, o escribirnos al correo electrónico comusic 678 gmail.com. Los esperamos en los próximos ciclos de episodios. Mm -hmm.